Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Glenn Smith. I'm the watchdog and public service editor at the Post and Courier. Uh, and this is the latest installment of Beyond the Headlines. Uh, we're going to be looking at a story today, a project called the Saharan Connection. And joining me on the broadcast today are uh, the two people that produce this great piece of work. We have senior projects reporter, uh, lead project reporter as well, Tony Bartlemy, and photojournalist Andrew Whitaker. Welcome. Nice to be here. Uh, before we get started, I just want to remind everyone that the event uh, is being recorded, will be sent out later in an email. And if you have any questions, please submit them at the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and we will get to them just as soon as we uh, can. Um, Tony, we are broadcasting today uh, in the midst of this time when there's crazy number of storms brewing off the coast of Africa and in the Atlantic Ocean. We've had two named storms, three named storms already, but two in the Atlantic uh, just in the month of June, which is sort of unheard of. Uh, could not be more timely, right? Because the Saharan connection is all about the effect of dust and sand on hurricanes and how it can prove to be this force that tampens down storms and really directly affects us here. So how did you come up the idea to, to go to Africa and, and track this down? Where did this all come from? Yeah, Glenn, uh, nice to be with everyone today. And and yeah, Glenn, you couldn't be more correct uh, about the timeliness of it all. And um, th so the, the origin of, of this story really began last year when, I don't know if you all remember, but we had this really strange hurricane season where it began really early and then it just went completely flat. And the reason was because of all this dust that was blowing off the Sahara. So I, I originally heard about how the dust from the Sahara floats across the Atlantic and actually lands in the Carolinas and Georgia. I, heard, I read about that in a, in a great book by John McPhee about 25 years ago, and I kind of tucked away, tucked that away in my mind. Um, and so we, you know, we had that strange um, hurricane season. I, been thinking about this for a long time. And then we had this, this uh, seminar, uh, this presentation with um, a, a journalist from uh, Senegal, a guy named Nicholas Hawk, who had uh, done this really fascinating report about what was happening uh, to a city in Senegal that was under pressure from rising seas. And we, we just began to talk about, um, you know, the whole idea of the connectivity between Charleston and Senegal. I remember Glenn and I went out and had beers with him that night. And, and from that kind of origin, um, the, all those connections, we decided that we ought to take a deep look, but look at this story from a totally different perspective, from really from the West African uh, sort of scientists perspective. And to do that, we had to go. That was fascinating. Uh, now, Andrew, this is your first time ever leaving the country. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. Wow, that, was, that was a big, big trip to start out with. What, what was it like for you to go to West Africa? Uh, I, mean, I mean, it was it was really, really wonderful. Um, I think the the biggest challenge was uh, language barrier. Uh, I've never had to deal with that. And, you know, usually you know, with your camera, you know, talking to people and stuff like that, trying to get like you know, candid, you know, images. Um, I thought that was kind of a kind of a challenge, but overall the experience was something I've, you know, I've never had in my life. Yeah, it same seems such a, a strange and wonderful place, really wild and uh, so different than than what we have here. T Tony, what were some of the challenges you faced over there? Yeah, so this was a very, very challenging story to to do because because most people in Senegal, which is on the western side of Africa, western uh, um, western edge, and and Mauritania, where we also went, they speak French or Wolof. Uh, very very few people speak English, so you know it's difficult enough just to talk to scientists in English about these complex uh, issues, but try doing that in French and Wolof. So. To overcome that challenge, we we actually hired a, uh, a local journalist, uh, a, a woman by the name of Borso Tall, who was a fantastic translator, knew the area really well, and through her and through kind of our just uh, a lot of a lot of effort went into just finding scientists and talking to them. We uh, we managed to overcome that 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 language barrier. But we also had to go lots of different places too. We ended up driving about 900 miles uh, from 
Dakar, uh, which is the largest city in Senegal, to Saint Louis, which is near the northern border, uh, to uh, and then into Mauritania, which is this whole different world. That's where the Sahara really is. So we had this uh, very complex logistical, scientific, and language uh, uh, challenge. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about this trip into Mauritania. Yeah, so so Mauritania is just north of Senegal. Uh, it's a uh, it's a very large country with a very small population because it's basically just you know it's a desert. It's a, a, a true desert country, and it uh, is on the State Department's list of of countries that you probably shouldn't go to because there's a, a fair amount of ISIS activity in the eastern part of the country, especially. And to get there, you basically have to hire a boat, a canoe, we, they call them pirogues, and cross, uh, cross a river, the Senegal River, uh, and then meet some immigration folks and then, then make your way. So we did all that and that required lots of negotiations and then lots of very uh, difficult conversations with immigration people uh, when we got there. And then we had to find a, a driver and, and that created a whole nother exchange because we think that one of the drivers who wanted to take us somewhere was an undercover police officer. So, you know, and we're, you know, we just really stood out. It wasn't a place where tourists go, so to speak. It was, it was also difficult, um, sorry for interrupt, but um, I mean, you know, the challenge of like photographing like dust, you know, you have to go find it. Um, you know, you have to go in the desert. Um, and it's also not a country that's like quite, I guess, welcoming to cameras. You know, we don't we didn't know what was going to happen, um, you know, with my gear and stuff like that. But kind of was the, the fun part of that, um, you know, kind of finding ways to, you know, making stops and, you know, photographing along the way. And uh, honestly, we could thank, you know, Borso for that because it was kind of like this journey for her that allowed us to make, you know, these beautiful images um, as we went further into the country. Yeah, our cover yes. story was, wasn't was really about, um, you know, we, we didn't necessarily broadcast that we were journalists. We were going with Borso, who's, who actually has some relatives in Mauritania, and she had just gotten married just before uh, we, we um, got together. In, in fact, we kind of joked about how she was on her, the worst honeymoon ever with with Andrew and I, but you know, we essentially just made our way into Mauritania, and 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 we would we just stopped in a village, for instance, and and walked into essentially a, a group of houses, and then pretty soon, thanks because of uh, Borso's uh, know-how, uh, we were sitting on uh, on a rug with having tea with a bunch of people who, um, you know, we could barely talk to. So Andrew, you, you sort of touched on this a little bit, the logistics with the gear. I remember like when, when we first started talking about this, we're like, oh, we should get some like great drone shots of the Sahara and all this. And right off the bat, it was like, no, we're not bringing any, no one's bringing drones into this country. We're not allowed to bring drones into the country. Did you find you had any much trouble get, getting your gear around or getting past checkpoints with the cameras and stuff? Yeah, I mean, for the most part, you kind of, you didn't like wear it around you like you would, you know, in Charleston. Um, you kind of like, kind of just kept it under the seat and took it out when you felt like you really wanted to make an image. So you, you kind of have to sit back and actually think about, you know, what are the photos that you really want to get um, and just kind of be, you know, cautious that way. Um, you know, most of our images were actually taken while driving, you know, going down the highway. Uh, we made a few stops, like going through the village, but, you know, I, when we were invited to, you know, have tea with his family, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I kept my camera in my bag. Uh, I, you, you don't know, you know, with, with a camera, no matter where you are in the world, you know, it's kind of like this, you know, stressful box and people always think like, you know, like no pictures, no pictures. And so you got to kind of like think about, you know, when is the right time to actually make these images? Uh, but it worked out. Uh, actually, the guy uh, that he showed me that we had tea with showed me around his village. And at the end, kind of just like, you know, like pointed at my camera and just like get it like a muscular, like, you know, pose. And he wanted me to take his picture. So I thought that was kind of a, a fun little moment. 
How about the challenges of trying to illustrate uh, this this whole story about dust at a time when there's really not much dust in the air? You get there, there's not the dust storms that we've seen in past years. It's kind of an off time as well. How, how do you illustrate this story without having that? So obvious. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I got I get excited seeing like images of dust storms, and you you prep for that. And after a few days, you're kind of realizing, you know, shoot, you you might not see these giant dust clouds so like you got to think about like what's our alternative way of telling a story about dust without photographing dust and that's like I guess the journey through the desert the you know what you see and honestly just kind of you know make images that are you know that you think are powerful right then in, in the spot and then kind of think how they can come into play later on uh you know you you know get detail stuff of like dust or you know silhouettes maybe camels crossing the road and stuff how how you know different elements that are in dust that you know that surround it that without showing it um it kind of gives that illusion of that you are in the desert you want to feel the heat of Mauritania you want to feel the sand between you know beneath your toes uh, that's just what the the feeling you want to get in, in Mauritania, it was it was really beautiful because of the the color of the sand. It really has that kind of orange uh, tint to it, and and we we had to really go see the go see the dust. And you know, the, journalistically, the you know one thing we noticed immediately was, was there wasn't that much dust in the air. And I, I remember thinking, oh, you know, this is a kind of a bummer for our story. But then then I thought, I remember early in May, we went in early in May, and we, it, it was sort of interesting to think about, it, about whether or not this lack of dust would fuel more hurricanes early in the season. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, in a big way, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Tony, you've, you've been able to go on a couple of these trips over the years, more than a couple. Uh, the Pulitzer Center, with its incredibly generous uh, partnership, has allowed us to go places like Senegal and Greenland. Um, why is it so important? Like, why, why couldn't you just pick up the phone and call some scientists over there, do some emails and uh, throw together a story? Why is it so important to go there on the ground experience it firsthand? Yeah, you know, I think our readers really, you know, respect when when you make a little extra effort to, to get the story. And, and there's just, you know, there's no you can't write a, a narrative unless you really experience it. And you can, you know, you feel that sand, literally, you know, the heat of that sand going through your shoes and then describe, describing that to, to readers is, is kind of the gifts that we can give them as, as journalists, is, is share our experiences with them. And you just can't do that over the phone in the same way. So we've been really fortunate. So, uh, you know, more and more, you know, journalism can be very expensive to do. And it's folks like the Pulitzer Center, which is this great nonprofit that it helps um, helps make a lot of stories, you know, dozens and dozens of stories possible around the country, around the world. Uh, they make them possible um, by by uh, through grants. And we we couldn't have done probably couldn't have done that story without their help. Yeah, I mean, a common theme running through these works, right, is is how small and interconnected our world is in, in reality and how events in far off places have a very direct effect here, as you showed in the Greenland story, as you've shown here and, and throughout our Rising Waters coverage. Um, is that story being told enough, you think? I mean, do, do, out there, do people realize these these connections? Yeah, I think the connectivity is a you know, is a... Uh, an evolving theme of our stories that, that I think is really important and and helps, I don't know, it helps bring everybody together to know that the dust from Africa affects us, you know, how, you know, the, you know, the, the melting ice in Greenland, how that, that effect literally affects our sea level here and, and just bringing everybody together. That's, um, you know, that's, that's the, the, the thing that really gets me excited about doing these stories. Also, just you know, bringing back, uh, um, bringing back some sand too. That was kind of cool. So this is sand from Mauritania that was in my shoe. <laughs> hey, Andrew, your images that you came back with were, were simply stunning. I mean, just ab absolutely uh, eye-opening. The, the beauty of it, particularly those shots, like in in the deserts. Um, 
How did you go about capturing these, um, these images in a way that was respectful to the people that you were encountering along the way? Because I know like you stop and you want to capture these scenes. I mean, do, do you ask permission first? Do you have a conversation? Do you start to be sort of a fly on the wall and obtrusive? How, how do you approach that? Yeah, and if we, we could probably show some images while I talk about that. Um, but uh, yeah, so basically, you know, I mean, a lot of these scene setters, you know, there, there's no people, so you don't really have to like actually ask the sand's permission. But, you know, when you're like in like a, you know, larger city or a village, um, you know, you kind of just, even if without a language barrier, you kind of just like talk to them about, uh, you know, like you point at the camera and you say, you know, like kind of like body language of how do you, like, can I take your picture? And, you know, if they say no, then, you know, then you leave, let it be. And you're going to, you're going to get these images no matter what. And um, we can keep going through. Uh, but like, yeah, you kind of, I mean, most of these, you know, images that I, I think the ones that really stand out to me are the ones that I kind of just, you know, did my own thing, kind of waited and waited for the moment to happen. You know, like you, you see a sand dune, you, you kind of wait for, you know, someone to walk up. It. I mean, you see it once, it's probably going to happen again. But, you know, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think, you know, no matter where you are, you know, when you, when you photograph people, I mean, they're either going to say yes or no. And most likely, you know, they will allow you to, to, you know, make their image. And so it's kind of a, kind of a cool thing. Um, but I think like sitting back and just kind of figuring out what the photo is, um, is kind of the fun part. And just like, you know, looking with your eyes and then you putting the camera up to it and then capturing something. Yeah, I mean, I, I imagine there's a little trade-off there with uh, you want the spontaneity of the shot and the, that fly on the wall aspect, but also you don't want to do it in such a way you feel like you're disrespecting the people or the culture. Typically, I will I'll make the image first, then then ask their you know their permission. I won't use it if they say no, but uh, or if like I'm like I really like the image, I'll, I'll show them like this is beautiful, and they're like oh yeah, go for it. And so, um, but yeah, I mean, it kind of you kind of just you you make the image first and then you kind of you know see how it is or you know it's always about it's all uh, you know no matter what journalism photojournalism it's all about talking with people and then you know that's how you communicate you know visually what are we looking at there so this is uh the lighthouse in Dakar there's actually two lighthouses um it's kind of a, out of the scene center near the most western point of Africa which is kind of you know interesting because off the coastline is just where like most of our Atlantic hurricanes come from. But being similar, you know, it has like the same feel as to Charleston as the the Morris Island Lighthouse Sorry. lit up in the middle um, of the ocean. Because it it really wouldn't be a photo essay from you without a few uh, lighthouses and sunsets, right? Yeah, I even photographed a full <laughs> moon uh, while you know we were driving in a taxi, but I had to get my full moon shot too. Okay. Then here's a camel cross. This is actually through our windshield um, driving in Mauritania, but like, you know, how often do you see a camel crossing the road? Uh, it's kind of like, you know, the whole, you know, chicken joke, but um, <laughs> to get to the other side of the desert, but yeah, you know, you have to. Have that, while we have that camel shot up, I don't know if you, re you remember the most surreal moment in the, in the entire trip for me. Well, the, maybe the second most, but the most surreal moment was when we're driving through Mauritania and we're seeing stuff like that with a, a driver who doesn't speak English, he's in Arabic, and we're we're just kind of wondering where we're going when all of a sudden on the radio, you, we start uh, hearing Stevie Wonder's part-time lover song. So, and I'm sorry I mentioned that because now everybody's going to have that in their ear right now. <laughs> Worst things to have there, I guess. Okay. So th this is actually us. So we had to get in a, a pirogue, a wooden canoe, and then and then cross this river to into Mauritania. And uh, that yeah, that required a lot of negotiation with the the people who you know run the boats, and then the immigration people as well. It's the same lighthouse um, earlier in the day. But it kind of just gives that feel of like, you know, the, I mean, it's, it has like a very 
Charlestonian feel, but yet again, it's like other side of the world. I mean, instead of looking, you know, looking east, it's looking west, um, which is like that that mirror image of Charleston and Senegal. And then detail, you know, shots of sand. Um, sand has a really beautiful texture to it. This is me flying a drone off the beach of San Luis. Uh, this was actually a great moment. Uh, behind the camera uh, is Borso kind of distracting these you know, like dozens of kids that otherwise would probably be fascinated with the drone. But I think she sprayed like perfume on them or something and then showing like, you know, uh, baby photos and, you know, her, you know, uh, new husband. Um, so that kind of helped out, you know, launching the drone without any like too much distraction. And what people can't see in this picture, there's just, yeah, just a tremendous amount of activity around us. And, um, you know, do, getting drone shots is uh, in some countries is is either illegal or frowned upon or makes people nervous because of military actions and things like that. And while we were there, there was there were a bunch of protests that were um, that had just happened. And then the day we left, there were other protests in a country that's really known. Senegal is known for a pretty stable democracy. So everybody was a little bit on a uh, more uh, on alert than normal. But we did manage to take a few drone shots amid that. This is back in Mauritania. Uh, this is where I think we pulled over because we saw a giant dune and we climbed it and you know, I think it burned our feet through our shoes. But, you know, you just see the color, you see the, you know, the village and you kind of just it just with the, you know, the orange sand and the trees and you just, you know, you just kind of have to get that that photo. There's Tony on that sand, sand dune. It's in my shoes. Got proof. <laughs> and this is interesting. Um, so this wasn't in this story. Uh, this will actually be part of a story that's coming out on July 9th. But it's like, you know, so we're there for two different, you know, stories, you know, and you got to think about when you're making these images, which fits best with which story. And honestly, when you make this photo, you you know you don't know what where, where this is going. I mean, this is kind of it's a some our, our, our we had a guide kind of brought us into town in San Luis, and he's like, you have to see this, you know, this pelican. And it's this white pelican, and I guess it thinks it's a goat, and it's like this best friend with this goat. And I'm taking pictures, and of course, it tries to you know bite my camera, but you know you make that frame, but it's just kind of interesting. You don't really I don't know that I've ever seen inside of a pelican mouth before, but um, it's actually kind of included in uh, the story coming up. Yeah, we we went there for two kind of two main stories. One is about how the dust from from the Sahara ends up flowing into the trade winds, and then this um, layer, air layer, actually snuffs out hurricanes. So dust is a, it can be a good thing when it comes to hurricane formation. A good thing for us, that is. And then. Um, our second story is is going to take a look at a city in Senegal, San Louis, and and which just built a seawall, just finished its seawall, and we're kind of looking at the lessons that that, that community learned building their seawall uh, yeah, as we consider a seawall in Charleston. And that's coming up July 9th, uh, uh, you know, about a week or so. Yeah, and that again, that uh, sort of that that small world, right? Nick Nick Hawk. Uh, journalists with Al Jazeera uh, had come over here to participate in the Climate Now uh, panel at the College of Charleston with us. And the more we talked about some of the shared, um, he's, he's based in, in uh, Senegal. Um, the more we talked about our experiences here and our, his experiences there, even walking around Charleston, I remember him looking and saying, this is all Huguenot architecture and there's so similar to San Louis and there's our city is being threatened by rising seas and and it's 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 just amazing sort of the shared experience you can come across so so andrew what was your most surreal moment of the trip honestly i think it was having tea in mauritania um it's it's the idea of making a connection with someone without 
actually physically, you know, speaking to them, you know, just through, you know, speaking, communicating through body language and just sitting, being invited and to sit on their floor and have a cup of tea. And it was just kind of honorable. And I just thought that was like, honestly, probably my most, you know, favorite moment. That, that was a wonderful moment because, you know, just imagine walking into a village to, you know, two guys in a, in a translator walking into some random village and, you know, and being accepted uh, immediately. And so Andrew and I pretty essentially just sat on, on the rug while Borso tall talked with the, the, the women and, and really connected with them. Yeah, but it was, it was a beautiful moment. Don't, don't have any questions right away. Again, you can submit some down at the Q&A uh, function at the bottom. Did have a nice comment from Sarah, who has a, uh, been a Peace Corps volunteer and uh, really enjoyed your story. You can mention another surreal moment, and that's when there were we, we uh, ended up with another guide in Dakar and ended up in a neighborhood 30, 40 minutes away um, from our hotel uh where people dress up as as lions and beg for money uh, to for a fundraising effort and 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 then it's called the simba dance and it, it was you know this one of these very sort of authentic uh experiences that you know not a lot of people get to see and and andrew kept on getting accosted because he had had a camera and had to fend off the lions a lot yeah, it was it was pretty cool because uh, yeah we we found this guy because I wanted to go get photos of the this fishing village and you know right when the you know the boats are coming in and it's like this giant fish market and afterwards he's like oh you're a photographer you you would love to see this and it's it was just so surreal it was just awesome yeah like it was like a twenty minute drive out into the deep neighborhood in Dakar and it's like the sun goes down and gets dark and then you hear the drums and the the lion the you know, dancing and yeah, it was really cool. Uh, I mean, it wasn't really, you know, related to dust, but being there and photographing that was just like one of the most amazing experiences. Did Did you, you guys know, do any line dancing or? We did. I, uh, Tony and I both did. Um, there's a photo somewhere of Tony uh, sure doing hope. some dancing. <laughs> but <laughs> But Please it was sure cool. that would be at some point. Yeah. <laughs> but I think, yeah, the, uh, hundreds of, of people were highly amused and yeah. probably embarrassed for us. Um, we, we have a couple questions here. Um, did you, from Tom here, did you have any opportunities to chat with local journalists in either country? We did. We uh, our second night there, we we had uh, we had a really nice dinner with Nicholas Hawk from Al Jazeera and uh, and then uh, another correspondent from from Reuters, who, you know, have these amazing stories about how they've, you know, escaped, you know, detention and been involved in riots and all sorts of things, and and it really kind of helped us uh, kind of understand a lot of what what's happening in in West Africa. Okay. Uh, second one from Susan here uh, says, thank you for sharing this fabulous experience and good for you for your adventurous spirit. was wondering if the desert is all sand or does it have some rocky areas like the desert in the Middle East? Yeah, thanks, Susan. Um, yeah, the, you know, the, the, it's not all just sand. There's a lot of, you know, rocky areas. And, and then surprisingly in Mauritania, I kept on uh, I was kept on being surprised by the amount of acacia trees that were green, even though it was 105 degrees. And so that you would see these sort of groves of acacia trees. And then, yeah, so it's a mix of sort of dunes, just, and then just sort of flat dust, uh, some rocky areas that um, we, I would actually like to have gone to see a uh, little farther east, but uh, we couldn't make it that far. It was too dangerous. D does it sort of gradually come into view or is it just all of a sudden yeah so as soon, as soon as you cross the the senegal river you uh and and go into mauritania it, it just gets drier and drier and then then you start seeing the dunes and then um yeah it's it, it's it's a it's a pretty fast fast change senegal itself is a lot more lush in in, in parts okay 
All right, we're, we're coming towards the end of our time. Any last minute thoughts uh, either of you would like to impart? Any takeaways? No, I just think it's really important to talk about how, you know, all these important climate mechanisms and 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 how, you know, one thing over, you know, 4,000 miles away can affect us here so much. And uh, that connectivity is is a, a real challenge to to make for our readers, and I'm just privileged to do so. Great. Okay, I'd like to thank everyone for watching and thank our panelists here for sharing your experiences. Remember that you can sign up for any of our free newsletters at postandcourier.com slash newsletter dash sign up. If you're a subscriber, we'd like to th thank you as always, appreciate that. If you're not a subscriber, you can sign up at postandcourier.com slash subscribe. Um, again, till next time, thank you so much for uh, spending your lunch hour with us and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon.